thank you very much for the kind invitation and, and kind introduction. Uh, so I'll be speaking about the constitution of ultra-high field MRI to dynamic structural imaging. And uh, I guess I, I probably have to disclose that I, I know more about ultra-high field than I know about uh, dynamic imaging. But uh, so please bear with me if I say something uh, offensive uh, when it comes to the virus. Um, but uh, I'll, I'd like to start by giving a bit of an overview of how we'll our structure just in the next 15 minutes. I'll first speak about uh, what changes with the ultra high field. And then I'll give you some new ideas of uh, what kind of uh, structural imaging flavors you have, uh, if you want to start this one, and some examples of, of these applications with climate imaging. At so obviously we, we are all excited to, be to go to these high fields and the, and the promise that they give us is that you get a lot more of our SNR. So you know that the SNR increases both because you get more magnetization, you get uh, somehow the way we detect uh, signal MRIs by, by signal induction. And so this you, that comes with the promise of a squared uh, increase in, in SNR. But there's also things that make uh, noise increase with magnetic field, sample noise, call noise. And uh, when it uh, push comes to shove, uh, what people have shown quite nicely is that uh, the increase of, my, of SNR with the magnetic field is actually something around 1.5 or 6. So now you can decide to use these uh, extra SNR that you gain when you go to the right field to either um, acquire images with higher SNR at the same resolution or um, acquire images at the same SNR by doing faster imaging and maybe try more contrasts. Uh, uh, usually the, the, what people try to do is to, to keep a more or less the SNR constant and try to go to, to a higher special image. But one thing that it's very important to think is that actually, when, we, when it comes to resolution, uh, I feel doesn't offer that much because it is the volumetric resolution that comes linearly with the, with the increase of SNR. It's not actually the, the pixel resolution. There's a, a bit of an extra complexity that comes uh, in this process, which is the fact that what we, what we care is not so much uh, S, uh, SNR, but we want to, to know how much contrast we have uh, between the different uh, structures. And we want to have, uh, we want to know how much uh, contrast do we have uh, in, a, uh, in a given amount of, amount of time. And so this is usually how we, we would uh, frame it. So you, you have to write a, a signal of a given sequence, Think of its relaxation parameters, which are actually a function of the zero. Think how are we going to optimize the parameters based on the, on the relaxation, and then we have to take into account the efficiency of the acquisition. So if you look at the relaxation times as we go from lower fields to higher fields, uh, the two ones tend to get longer and longer, and you say, well, that's very good because now we can distinguish a lot uh, easier the, the, between the gray matter and white matter. So Sites are uh, having a light trail. Um, it, can, it can help us distinguish, through, for example, thalamic structures, which are somewhere here between gray and white matter ones. And on the other hand, the two stars are, are decreasing, which means that we can uh, acquire images faster. But if, if we start putting all these things together, uh, it actually comes into a bit of, a, of an unfortunate uh, uh, result for, for high field. And maybe this is my, me uh, trying to, to, to go for low field imaging. But if you, for example, want to optimize it to star contrast, which is uh, this uh, is probably what used for gold fMRI or what used for QSM, you want to make sure that your echo time is somewhere close to the peak to star of the tissue of, of interest. And you want to make sure that you have uh, an acquisition as long as possible. And then you try to optimize the PR and making it uh, as soon as possible so that you go, um, you, you're always acquiring. You try to get a flip angle that maximizes your SNR, that's usually the Ernst angle. And if you take it all, uh, also the, into account the relaxation changes, what happens is that the effective increase that you get uh, with magnetic field, it's not, it's no more a 1.5 term or 1.6, it's actually just one, and it gets even lower for some of the other uh, contrasts. The, the biggest penalty, though, of, of uh, let's say, an increase of SNR, which uh, is was not a bad thing. One of the things that, that uh, is probably detrimental, especially when we're speaking about segmentation, is the fact that as we go to high magnetic fields, we have to use higher frequencies, they are proportional, and they have a smaller wavelength. So when you're imaging uh, uh, at 1.5 Tesla, you have a very long wavelength, which is much bigger than the brain you're trying to image at 
pretty start, uh, and, and that means that you can actually light up your brain in a very homogeneous way for the entire uh, picture. At 3T, things get a bit uh, less, uh, let's say, your light, the pitch shine is homogeneously, and at, at 70, it gets quite uh, horrible. So I always like to, to look at uh, my first image at 70 times. That looks like this. It's, it seems like ideal to look at the thalamus because this is usually the, the place where you have the, the highest uh, SNR uh, or, or highest uh, ability to, to excite. Uh, but yeah, still, despite these problems, I think it's. Uh, if you want to know what you can get uh, from from my field, I, I suggest that you, you, you go to this collection on, on scientific data from Newsprint and, and download this data, because he, he, it, it took uh, the effort of um, acquiring T1 weighted, T2 weighted, T2 star weighted, QSMs, all sorts of contrasts, and average them over uh, over 20 sessions. And so, if you know what you, what you can see in the my field, uh, this is probably a data set where you where you can find it. So let's uh, go through the, the pros and cons. So you, you do get high SMR that allows you to get great images. You, you get increased stability contrast, um, which is good for both, your sense to star contrast. But it also means that you have more induced distortion, which is a problem if you're using UTI readouts. And you also get a lot of dropouts around the veins. So one thing that uh, you have to be careful with we'll seeing some uh, cases later is that veins tend to be a bit dominated in some of the images. Um, you get a shorter T2 star, that means that you don't have to wait to image, but it also have, means that you have less time to image, so it's not only a good thing. Um, you have an increased T1 contrast, that means that you have to do slower imaging, and that's what, uh, what causes this decrease of the effective SNR gain that you get when you go to high imaging. And you have this uh, big T1 in homogeneity and SAR, the, the, the fact that you, you tend to sweep up subjects uh, with energy. So, to star weighted phase imaging, uh, separate weighted imaging, uh, or even bold, they are all things that you win a lot with um, the wide field. Also, T1 weighted uh, is, is a big winner, and we'll be seeing that uh, T1, T2 weighted, and fusion weighted imaging are, are less of, of winners in this scenario. Before I start showing images, because I think this is already a lot of dynamic images, uh, I would like to show some graphs uh, uh, before. Just for us to understand of what are what are some of the problems of of high field when we are imaging with different sequences. So uh, here we have uh, in different colors. We have um, the signal of uh, CSF, gray matter and white matter. So this, this be for, for the case of a, a gray integral sequence, if it's acquired in the proton density environment or in the Fermi's We usually acquire in this full line uh, uh, regime. And here is, is the relative the one that you have. Uh, inside the, the subject's brain. So usually you say, I try to have the exact uh, the thing I aim, but in practice, you have all these range of values within the brain, and within the thalamus, you have this dark red uh, area. So you can see if you, if you acquire with a, with, a grade, with a standard grade interval, you have a lot of signal variation intensity, which has nothing to do with changes in tissue, but it's just because of this lightning, uh, lightning that you are uh, this transmit field that, that you are putting in the author. The same thing happens uh, uh, for the MP rate. So if, when you uh, image the MP rate, you have a huge bias uh, that, can, that can come from, from um, uh, this transmit uh, field you want, which gets somewhat fixed when you're doing an MP2 range. And you can see that the MP2 range has a, has a very kind of flat signal intensity across uh, uh, varying uh, levels of transmit field view. And it gets really bad when you get to the tubospinacle sequences. So uh, TSC, 2D TSCs or 3D TSCs, they usually have a very big variation of intensity. And it's not just linear like in, in the gradient echo, it's actually really complicated. It's, it, it has a bit of a quadratic shape. So you can have, uh, in some cases, increases of, of, of signal because you have higher V1, or you can have even a decrease of signal because you have higher V1. And we'll see some of the impact that, uh, that particularly this one has when you do thalamic imaging. So um, one thing that, that got people really excited from the start was the fact that uh, what well, these images could have done that, that really showed that uh, you can have uh, very strong contrast in the middle of the brain, both in the magnitude and the phase, and, and quickly uh, soon after 
uh, abortion uh, about show that you can use big several in several ways imaging. I, I think then uh, what started making it uh, more interesting to make sure that we don't have these, these bias problems was the work actually from uh, Andreas Bates, where he showed that if you start looking not at uh, necessarily at the magnitude and the base image, which is used for frequency, but you start looking at, at QSM maps and not star maps, you can actually start seeing some of these, uh, for example, the beam structure and the moving arm field and so on. And these are also visible on the other star maps. And these are visible, not surprisingly, also across other subjects. You can also see the like these more like uh, myelinated regions here. Uh, another, uh, but this is when trying to use quantitative imaging to, to look at the town. So QSM map is not. The, still, if you want to have high SNR, uh, SWI seems to be the way to go uh, for. But one, one thing that is very uh, unpleasing in, in, uh, in the images is the fact that you have such strong uh, vein contrast. And so you, you end up looking at veins rather than being able to, to extract uh, uh, calamity in the eye. So uh, George uh, in, in Lausanne did a very nice work where he started to try to identify these veins uh, automatically. And that allowed him to go from the standard T1 weighted and standard uh, SWI images to somewhat uh, um, enhanced images. And here you can really start uh, seeing uh, now some, some more medial, uh, uh, more lateral nuclei of the, of the thalamus that start uh, being enhanced. And this is uh, visible across multiple subjects. So we're not, now not seeing only medial versus uh, uh, lateral, but we're seeing the medial, uh, some people of, of the between medial and lateral, and uh, and the lateral uh, look. And the, if you look at this contrast, this SWI contrast, it, it's supposed to be uh, correlated with iron. And if you look, for example, on, on big brain histology data. It seems to correlate quite well with also what uh, what relates to cell body density. So that, that's that's the kind of information you might extract from SWI or R2 star maps, etc. Human contrast, on the other hand, they uh, um, so the T1 weighted images the, we've seen already before that have a slight kind of a fading contrast from medial to lateral. Uh, and, and if we think that the T1 is often kind of that related to the myelination, we say that you have an increased myelination from the middle part towards the lateral part. And one thing that you can try to do to improve this, uh, and this is something we did on the MPT, right, just to try to widow the contrast. And now I, I don't mean widow the contrast in the sense of changing the intensity scale of your, of your viewer, but changing the, the sequence parameters so that you can actually highlight this nuclei. And you start seeing again the same kind of uh, contrast that you've seen also to some extent on the SWI, where you see the, the medial parts are very highlighted, but also some uh, the edges uh, being now a, a bit more clear. Uh, I don't think we were the only ones trying these uh, approaches of of, of, uh, of trying to window the contrast to optimize uh, calamity contrast. I think that the the group in Stanford did a, a really nice, a nice uh, work where they were. Playing with MP rage, trying to see can we know the signal of white matter or gray matter uh, or with the standard MP rage. And they observed that indeed, uh, at least white matter knowing, you, 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 it's not so much that you have a much stronger contrast, but your, uh, your relative contrast is much higher and allows you to, uh, uh, using uh, atlas segmentation to automatically uh, terminate already many nuclei. Uh, but I, I think it, it's important to know the, uh, the, the reason probably why it's so easy to, to or not so easy, but it's possible to use uh, uh, net neural networks to go uh, from the white matter knowing to the, the standard. It's also because the, the contrast mechanism is not really changing much uh, uh, when, when you're changing just the version. Now, the, the, the third type of images is actually it's our level to speak about. It's about two weighted images, and, and this is the one that I told you that was very sensitive to be one in the So these are three flavors of T2-weighted imaging. And these are the one that is often mentioned that you have some kind of thalamic uh, uh, structure here, here in the middle. And, and this is so that, that it was, uh, quite promising. Now, what, what's interesting to, to note is actually, for example, these images that we had already some years ago where we were 
acquiring uh, deeply weighted images uh, with very nice thalamic structure, that we observe that actually, if you, if you are able to fix these lightning conditions of, of, uh, of, of 7T by using, in our case, we're using a technique called KT points, where we, we're able to homogenize the lightning in the middle of the thalamic area, your thalamus disappears. Suddenly, it's, it's, it's not there anymore. So it's, it's really kind of tricky to look at uh, T2 weighted uh, at thalamic uh, structures when you're using uh, T2 weighted images. So to wrap up the uh, talk, uh, just some quick con uh, conclusions. Prior to does offer increased endogenous contrast noise ratio. These techniques based on SWI or PSM contrast, they, they, they offer the clearest delineation of, of the full binocular nucleus. But uh, I'd also say that uh, because we're not really struggling for, uh, especially when we're speaking about uh, the in our nucleus, you're not really struggling for resolution. You can actually do it quite well also with 3 d uh, in QSM maps. And the min contrast mechanisms that are hypothesized uh, for, for these types of images are iron, but also paint. So it's actually important to make sure that you, you deal with paints uh, when, when treating these. And uh, it's always good to keep in mind that QSM has somewhat a superior localization for SWI. Because SWI uh, somehow uh, displaces the contrast from the from the places where it's actually active. The T1 contrast encodes malination, uh, and like uh, techniques like automated uh, Thomas segmentation have been demonstrated both in white matter node MP rays and MP2 rays synthetic images. So that, that's clearly a one way to do it uh, at 70. And T2 weighted images is really tricky to interpret, and that's because. You want to homogeneity starts mixing T1 contrast in, into the images, and so you don't really you don't really know anymore what you're seeing. You don't you don't know if you're seeing the myelination of the T1 contrast or if you're seeing the the iron concentration that comes on the T2 weighted process. So with this, I'd like to thank you uh, both for your intention and your inspiring work. Love you. Good. Uh, discussion. Thank you.